Okay. So welcome to the second day. Um, today, uh, this slide is actually lying. Today, you are going to see a couple of demos um, of how to use the portal aspect. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, these are the same links from yesterday. Um, but um, yeah, today we will do a couple of demonstrations of looking at um, Type 1A supernovae from the DP0 data set um, in the portal aspect. So Greg will uh, take you through one of those and then Gloria will take you through the second. After that, um, we'll take a short break and then we'll come back to um, we uh, to form into breakout groups and work on explorations or projects that um, that you are interested in working in. So um, if you've thought of anything since yesterday or if you think of anything during the session, um, we will we'll compile a list of, of uh, things that people want to work on and everyone can um, get together and uh, work together at exploring in more detail in breakouts later. So um, without further ado, I guess I'll um, let Greg take it away and uh, give you a demonstration of some of the things the portal can do. All right. Thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, let me start sharing my screen here. Uh, so uh, today we are going to be talking primarily about the uh, uh, portal aspects of the uh, Rubin Science Platform. And something I should mention right from uh, um, from the beginning that uh, uh, the portal aspect is sort of the easy way to ease yourself into Rubin data. Uh, portal aspect has a lot of functionality, but it's relatively straightforward and it's pretty intuitive. At least I didn't have any difficulty learning about that, even though I never really used it before. If once you get really good with the portal, then you probably want to do things a bit more um, sophisticated and uh, for instance write python scripts and so on and so forth and for that purpose i think that uh, going to a notebook uh, uh, part is is probably a bit better so let me just uh, first of all let me get rid of all this stuff on my screen here and uh, the um let me first log out and i'm gonna log back in okay so don't be surprised so this is where you would land when you start the Rubin Science Platform. And this morning or yesterday, you were working primarily with notebooks. Today, we're going to work with the portal aspects. I'm clicking on that. And uh, uh, normally, I would have some form of uh, uh, authentication and stuff like this. But I think that portal is authenticating me uh, correctly. I just hope that uh, I did not screw anything up. I think not. Stanford University is my provider. And that's excellent. That's probably what you see on your screens. By the way, something that I should say is that you can actually, if you do not want to get into the um, into the Rubin Science platform, you can basically follow what I'm going to be presenting here in the uh, um, in uh, dp 0 2 underscore lsst underscore io, and I'm going to cover portal intermediate. Dot RST and Tina, you're very good in putting uh, proper things into a chat window. So maybe I can ask you to do this if, if that's okay. All right. So what you will see when you land on this uh, on this uh, uh, portal aspect of the Rubin Science Platform will be basically the screen that you see in front of you right now. That's not exactly where you want to be because we're going to be actually using something slightly different. We're going to go uh, to basically we'll uh, work on the uh, dp 2 dc 2 catalogsobject but we're going to be using slightly different version of this. I'll come back to this in just one second. Okay, and the very first thing that we're going to do is we're going to convert this because what we would want to do is we'd want to find the um, something that is known as a, a object ID that will be associated with the supernova. We know that the, the goal here is that we know somehow that a supernova exploded in this particular uh, location and we want to explore the Rubin data in it. Okay, so notice that I now switched uh, my table from the catalogs.object to catalogs.dia object and DIA stands for uh, difference image analysis. Basically, the concept behind different difference image analysis is that there was, for instance, an image of a 
part of the sky that was taken last year and now every new image basically subtracts every new image that is being taken subtracts this set of template images and looks for the uh, particular objects that are significantly increased in the, in the brightness okay so this is the concept of difference image analysis okay so notice that i have quite a few um um, quite a few uh, entries here, but let me just go through a little bit more of an introduction. The so scientific motivation here is that user knows the coordinates of this low redshift supernova, and this, this is going to be something that will enter into coordinates or object name, uh, and now wants to find an I-band epoch in which the supernova was bright, and also wants to examine what is the um, uh, the uh, sync in this particular uh, case. So you, we will go to that, okay? Uh, for instance, the example might be that you want to, uh, to to register with the JWST image to characterize the underlying stellar population at the supernova location or something like this. So the whole idea here is that you know the RA index, you want to be able to examine the uh, uh, the light curve in this DIA catalog. Later on, uh, in uh, uh, I, I will mention that it is possible using something that is known as forced source photometry to examine the light curve at the location of a supernova that was not at the time of this explosion. But that's something that will come back in a, in a bit. So uh, this tutorial assumes that you basically have some kind of a very basic working knowledge of portal interface. Hopefully some of you might had a chance to look at it. But you know, I think that I'm trying to be sufficiently pedagogical here that you do not have to you know, feel like, oh yeah, I'm an expert and here's Greg who is showing me some kind of uh, second level uh, complexity of this but you know it's if you if you have not done any reading on the uh, on the portal that's fine this would be okay all right so there's one warning that i want to mention uh, which is the fact that we're going to be converting fluxes to magnitudes in the uh in a, a tab query in this tab search which is basically done via um via advanced uh, uh, astronomical data query language uh, adql okay uh, it's usually safe to do so whenever you have a relatively bright object which is flaring. Uh, it's because the supernova fluxes should never be negative in a difference image. Obviously, the previous image, presumably when there was no supernova explosion, was low by comparison to the supernova explosion. But it can happen that there is a supernova that also appears in a template image. Okay, so it's 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 one of those very strange cases. Um, so in some cases, the template images may be contaminated with a supernova flux. And that can happen in this simulation to as many as maybe 40% of DC2 supernovae 1A. So that leads to negative flux difference image, and therefore the overall offset of supernova light curves. And that would mean that you might end up having a negative flux, which then will get, not get converted correctly into, into magnitude. But that's that's sort of just a warning, but it's not all that important. All right, so I'm assuming that you logged into the portal aspect and under the tab searches. Uh, we are uh, going to use the same schema, the top collection schema that we have here. And uh, uh, in, we're going to use the default UI assisted part. You can see four buttons there. We were going to use the edit a ADQL in just a minute, but the button that I want to for you to make sure that you, you pushed on is the UI assisted. So we're going to actually enter the coordinates of this particular object, okay? And the coordinates would be 67 point four five seven nine okay and uh there is a comma this is the syntax minus 44.0802 okay and i'm going to ask for a cone within this location to give me all possible measurements within two arc seconds of this particular location we're not going to for this particular purpose we're not going to use the temporal box at all and the only thing that we really will want to extract from this output column is basically the declination. We want to learn what is the, this object ID, okay? And we also want to extract or, or, or put as a constraint the right ascension. And so this is only three of them. And then you can you can see this little funnel here that basically is a, a way to just select the only three of the uh, um, of the selection criteria here that's basically you only or three outputs of the table uh, with the selection criteria on the left hand side so notice that the we selected this cone within the location of the supernova but we we're still asking for the other images to pro, or for other data to provide you the array and declination of the object 
And that will be for us to determine how far away from the original of the coordinates is the particular object. But we'll come back to this in a minute. So let me just go to, to this, particular, uh, this particular search. And this is just a very beginning. I'm going to click on search. And at this point, you will see uh, basically uh, all the information that you really need. The most important part that you wanted to get from this information is this bit that has uh, that is listed in a column entitled DIA object ID. And this is this big long number with starting with one to two and so on and so forth, okay? So now when you know this number, now you can go and enter into the uh, tab search, into a different tab search, okay? I'm going to go back to this one. You can edit ADQL and you can put an ADQL query, which is basically astronomical data query language that will now look for the uh, flags of this object, but also for the sink and so on and so forth. So let me just, to, um, to, 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 to illustrate this, let me just go to um, another window on my, sorry, in my, in my computer. And uh, I'm going to enter that query um, from, from here. Just, sorry, sorry about that. Uh, maybe I will have to, I'm worried that I'll have to enter the query by hand because I didn't uh, uh, take it. So, um, Greg, I can copy it into the if, chat, I think. If you could copy it to a chat, that would be delightful. That way I can pick it up from chat. Oh, thank you very much. You're a lifesaver, Tina. This is great. <laughs> the only thing is, I'm not sure if I can actually copy it from chat into. A, yeah. Let me see if this works. Ah, nice. I think there's a command that did it work? Yep. Yay. Excellent. Thank you. Awesome. All right. That's great. Yeah, I forgot that that you know, when you are presenting, you cannot cut and paste very easily. So that's that's excellent. Okay. So in order to to for you to understand what is that I just have done is I am actually doing this ADQL query joining two different um two separate tables one of them is this dp02 dc2 catalogs dia source and the other one is the dp02 dc2 catalog ccd visit and the reason why i need to have those is because i need to have the specific from the catalog that is called ccd visit i need to find out what was the uh among others the the, the epoch of the observation and you can see that you have sorry that was my dog, sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> That's all right. So uh, now, again, I hope that uh, maybe at this point I should stop for a second and uh, and ask with whether there are any questions. So you can please raise your hand. And, and Tina, if you can see raised hands or, or maybe any, any information on chat, that would be great. So far, we look good. OK, good. All right, so now notice that we extracted a fair amount of information here. We extracted um, the DIA source midpoint type, which is basically the midpoint time of observation. We extracted the filter name for, the part for all sources that have this particular uh, object ID number that I have here on the, on the screen. And uh, we also are going to extract uh, the magnitude, which immediately will get uh, converted from the DIA source PS flux. And that's going to be this PS, PSAB magnitude and CCD visit seeing. So we also want to see how good is the seeing for here. OK, so now I'm going to uh, just click on search. And that will take just a, a quick second. And you will see actually three separate windows. OK. Uh, one window is just basically an image, which is not all that interesting for the purpose of this tutorial. Another window to the right hand side, which is active chart, gives us the positions of the different uh, uh, pointings where that particular source is, position of that where the source appears, as measured in the in that particular uh, pointing. So notice that the, on the left hand side that they, even though they, we are all with very, pretty close from the supernova, they're not identical. And on the right-hand side, on an upper right-hand side, you can see the different positions of the of this particular single object with the object ID, starting with one, two, five, two, two, okay? 
All right, so I'm going to, at the moment, go to, uh, basically, in order to be able to make the, the, the plots, I'm going to go to something that is known as by view tables. I'm going to dispose of the image. And notice that now I have less information on the screen, simply because I don't really care about what's going on in the image itself. So now, of course, what you really want to do is you want to see how the supernova really that the flux or the, the, the magnitude of the supernova looked like with the, as a function of time. Again, one tool that you will use is this little two gear gizmo, which basically tells you this is how we can change the chart options and have additional tools associated with this particular option. So let's click on this and immediately you will get this little sub screen that will say plot parameters. We, of course, have by default the first two columns, the RA and declination, but that's not what we want. What we would like to have in the uh, x-axis is, of course, the time of observation. So that is the midpoint. And notice that something's very cool. I only typed first two letters, and what started, start, what appeared, is the only particular column which actually starts with those two letters. This is midpoint TAI. Okay, and this is all great, but you know the. Uh, the, the Julian days are really not all that uh, easy to interpret because of the fact that they're very large. So what I'm going to do is I will subtract 60,000 from that. I know that that's roughly the current observations would be around Julian day 60,000 or so. So I'm going to leave it at that. Y column is, of course, not declination that we want, but we want to do something that we extracted from the... Uh, uh, using my ADQL query, and that's the conversion from flux to AB magnitude, and that's the PS ab mag. Okay, and um, you can leave the uh, trace styles points. That's not a, not a problem. But now you can click on a little arrow pointing to the right that says trace options. You can of course pick up some some different different aspects. You know, you can have circle, you can have color to be RGBA, but I I personally like. Uh, for this particular case to be red, and this is a great scale. And now, what you can add to this, it's you can you can see that you can, it's a pretty flexible tool. You can actually add a, a chart title, and the type title will be here: light curve. And for y label, uh, this is basically a label axis for y will be apparent magnitude. And this is in I band. And for X label will be basically what I just said, MJD minus 60,000. Okay, and I'm not going to set any restrictions on X min, X max and all that. But one thing they do have to do is to make sure that I reverse the Y axis simply because of the fact that it's magnitude. So the object has lower magnitude when it's brighter. So now it will go up and down rather than go down and up, which is what would happen if I, uh, uh, if I didn't do it. So, okay. At this point, I can just click apply and close this. And wow, look at that. Now we have a supernova light curve. And this sort of does look like a supernova. So this is really pretty cool. OK, so let me stop here for just a little bit of time and, uh, and whether anybody has any questions. Have I done anything? Have I pulled the rabbit out of the hat or, or it's pretty straightforward? I see there's some questions in chat. Uh, oh, yeah, Jeff is adding the fact that uh, um, uh, the very good question uh, from uh, uh, Tanaza. Uh, first of all, if you click on a line, the point on the plot turns into a different color. So just pay attention to this. You see, I'm clicking on this line, and different point turn into a uh, into orange is the lowest flux. And apparently, that's that's. And, and now I'm sort of going to look for a place where um, you know maybe the object was possibly brighter. But you can do the converse. You can click on the point. And then the line on the table will appear with yellow. So I hope that I, uh, I, re I uh, answer the question to Tanaza. Is that right? OK, good. So let me just look at the chat if there is any other questions. I have the chart, but it's upside down. Uh, sorry, I don't know why is that. Uh, uh, the the chart is upside down version of yours, and what you did miss is the fact that in the um, settings. Let me just close this window. In the settings, I at when I clicked on chart options, notice that I clicked on Y label Y label uh, under options reverse. Do you see it checked? 
now if I left it unreversed, it probably will look just like, oh, that's interesting. Okay, anyway, this is probably a, a, a subtle but strange. Yeah, we, found, we found that happened uh, yesterday on some people's computers when we did stuff uh, that uh, when you reverse it, it didn't change it. So there might be a bug we were talking about, um, maybe looking at that further. Thank you very much, uh, so. Tina, that this is indeed pot potentially a problem. So uh, Yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, it didn't reset one time when I did it too. So anyway. Yeah, that's great. But anyway, so... When you when you said I, I saw this that kind of bug coming up in in other instances that sometimes when you uh, return to the chart uh, options and try to put something else in doesn't always work. This is not the first time I've seen it. So this is something that definitely has to be brought up with the developers of the uh, portal aspect of the Ruben Science platform. Now the next thing I would like to do is I would like to put the uh, uh, to to plot the, uh, to generate a plot that will visualize that as astrometric scatter and to do this we're going to use uh, uh, under the two gears again we're going to add a new chart notice that there's three different buttons on top you can mod modify the trace which is what we tried to do you can overplot on the same trace but you can also add a new chart so that's what we're going to do now and what we're going to do is now add and it's going to be also a scatter plot and Tina, I will have to uh, ask you for another favor to put once again the RA and DEC, uh, uh, whatever X and Y into the chat window because I cannot see my uh, uh, whatever my, my other screen. So is okay. that okay? <clears throat> yes, hold on one second. Okay, it's you... uh, 3.4 in uh, uh, Portal Tutorial 2. 3.4, yes, okay. Do you? Oh, okay. Hold on. Okay. Yeah, this this is an, unfortunately something that is very difficult to deal with in Zoom unless you have. There you go. Multiple okay. Screens. Okay. Great. Fantastic. Is that is that what you need? That's the RA, but I also okay. need the other one. Yes, exactly. and I think I see a typo as well. There. Nope. I think this is right. Never mind. There you go. Okay. Okay. So I have to close this one enter x here and that worked okay now go back to my chat window and copy this guy again i'm doing all this because i'm an absolute lousy typist in the world so uh, uh that's one of the reasons why i'm doing this notice that this is actually um the 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 the, the two here uh two uh, two two equations or whatever two two um uh, whatever two quantities that I'm, I'm putting into X and Y really convert the uh, array and deck of the uh, of different positions to be precisely differences in uh, in the scatter from the uh, uh, from the location of the source. Notice that I have a uh, in, in in a case on top. I'm using this this location of uh, sixty seven point four five blah 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 and and so on and so forth. So here I really will have exact uh distance from the uh, from my pointing in arc second so let me close let me apply this okay and notice that uh, i on the right hand side now i have a, a new plot the plot has uh, um the basically astromatic scatter in arc seconds away from my central position and uh notice that the, the scatter is actually pretty good it's between point 0.1 ish and 0.3 ish arc seconds so it means that we did pretty well with this particular guy. So now we can uh, add to that one more plot. Uh, and uh, uh, you can also try to see what the sync was for the particular case, okay? So you can plot again the MJD, uh, the, the sync of the, which is also given to you in this, in this simulation in one of the uh, columns. And I'm going to slide my slider on the bottom again this is another thing that's sort of cute and you can see now uh, that you have this midpoint tai and you have sync and arc seconds and the absolute the, uh, sorry the apparent magnitude so so now let me add one more chart okay and again i'm going to click on the gear and i'm going to add more 
one, another chart. And for X, I'm going to do this MJD. Sorry, uh, not MJD, it's the uh, uh, midpoint. Minus 60,000. And for Y, I'm going to use the, again, this thing that is called seeing in arc seconds, okay? So now I can click, okay? And now you can see that sync in arc seconds and uh, varied, but it was pretty good. It varied from maybe as good as uh, 75 hundredths of, uh, of an arc second and went almost all the way up to about one arc second. So that implies that the simulations that we created were reasonably realis realistic here. So, uh, so I'm not going to uh, expand. There is a little bit more stuff that you could do uh, in if you read the uh, um, the tutorial itself. But I want to show you one uh, cool little aspect of this, and so I only have two more minutes that you can actually, without necessarily uh, uh, without necessarily doing any um, you know anything like you know re rerunning the 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 the, uh, the ADQL query, I can go back to my a RSP tab search and go to edit ADQL. And now notice that I selected this DIA source filter name as I here, okay? If I get rid of this, now I'm not requesting just the I filter, okay? So now I'm asking for all filters at that particular, uh, for that particular DIA, DIA object ID. So let me click on look and notice that now I have again RA index, so I'll have to change this, but uh, let me just very quickly modify this to uh, uh, to this uh, midpoint time minus sixty thousand. I'm not going to uh, sorry minus, and I'm not going to redo the labels. I just want to show you something uh, something cool, and this would be uh, um, again uh, the the the. Um, Yes, absolute magnitude, sorry. Yes, uh, apparent magnitude, okay. And uh, I'm going to apply this. And again, uh, now in chart options, of course, I have to make sure that I, in Y, I reverse it. So I have a, something a bit more meaningful. And I'm going to apply this and close. And notice that I have many more data points here. And again, I can actually, and the reason for that is that now I'm not requesting just the eye filter, but I'm also allowing other filters that were used for this particular observation. So among others, there's I, there is R, there is G, and I don't remember if, if any other, or there is Z. Interesting enough, there's no U filter because U observations are taken only during dark time using Rubin. So they will be a lot less frequent than observations in, in other band. But, uh, what I can, what I wanted to show to you is the fact that I can actually select now by myself one specific filter. I can do equal I, okay, and now hit the courage return, and notice what happened. That now I only have entries which have filter that is I band filter, and again I could do exactly the same thing by uh, by basically doing going for instance for R filter, okay. And there are very few R observations. Uh, looks like there's something in the chat window. So let me just check that. And uh, can you color the data by band? Um, yes, there's that's it, it is doable, but it's sort of tricky. That whole process of having plots with the data being colored by band is something that we have in tutorial uh, for portal tutorial. I think it's number five. And uh, it requires a little bit of a trick. And uh, those of you who want to see, the trick is very straightforward. What we would do is we would actually extract the ASCII value of the filter name. And that would be a different ASCII number between, for instance, R and I. And then you would assign different colors to different ASCII numbers. But that's probably beyond the scope of today's presentation. And the reason for that is that I have only 30 minutes and I'm already at at my limit, so I don't really want to run for for too long, especially that I would like to have maybe more questions. So sorry, Bob, but uh, um, you you're certainly welcome to take a quick look on the uh, on the portal, uh, or you might have seen it during my presentation at the, one of the assemblies for the portal uh, five.
All right, so I'm looking quickly if there is anything else that somebody asked. Okay. Right, so Jeff basically said that two arc seconds, given the, um, the, the, the data quality really would have only one object in it. If my search, if my tab search had more, and let's maybe do this, just uh, if I'm not getting, sort of force of the podium for the moment. Let me just go back to the tab search and uh, let me do in this particular case, instead of two, let me do 15 arc seconds and you can hit search here. Okay, and you will see that there'll be, I guess now maybe there wasn't any other object in this particular field of view, but, uh, um, oh no, yeah, yeah, yeah. There are different objects, notice that, uh, that there are multiple uh, multiple uh, DIA object IDs here. So again, that's the reason why I chose to work seconds. That was sort of almost arbitrary. Okay, so at this point, let me stop uh, and uh, I will be very happy to take questions. I, I don't see any raised hands, but I don't know if I can see raised hands. Tina, do you see any raised hands there? No, I see some clapping for you though. Someone clap. clapping. Oh, thank you. Thank Lots you. of people are clapping for you. <laughs> oh, that's great. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I, uh, I would go one step farther. I think that uh, um, if you guys want for uh, to learn a bit more about the the portal, we have we just recently posted a recording of my presentation of portal uh, tutorial for uh, basically looking for the uh, light curves floating in different colors, but also. Another tutorial that I posted recent that that I covered recently had to do with um, learning how to use histograms within the portal and both one-dimensional histograms, which I'm sure you're familiar with, but also two-dimensional histograms, which are often called heat maps. When you have a distribution of a number of objects as a function of, for instance, position or function of color or color and magnitude, you probably have seen color magnitude diagrams. Those are what very often people call heat maps. Basically, in each cell, you might have a a, a color that is associated with a number of uh, of, of ent entries there. All right, and uh, thank you very much, Jeff, for posting the uh, uh, the um, uh, that the plot. And in fact, I just today, or maybe about three hours ago, uh, posted the uh, the recording of it as well. All right, so at this point, I probably should stop sharing. I know that I have uh, already went about four minutes past my time, so uh, let's. Uh, continue with the with the next presentation here. So, uh, Jeff, back to you. Yeah, great. Um, and now we're going to continue uh, along these lines with with uh, Gloria, um, showing you more about um, how to examine. I think that same supernova in the portal. That could be, but. Okay. Do you see the portal? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. So I think if you just go back to the RSP tab search, that doesn't clear the previous uh, query. So uh, the the only way that I knew how to do it was by going to a new, uh, just by going to the um, RSP again. <laughs> but if somebody else knows how to do that. That would be cool if you could share. Oh, how to clear? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you if you do this reset columns and stuff, you 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 can clear everything if you reset uh, the filter. Oh. And then, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Uh so I'm going to uh go over portal three, which is a very uh quick tutorial on um how to potentially identify a uh Host galaxy for the uh, for the supernova that we just looked at uh, using images. So uh, for image queries, uh, you have to use the uh, image search ops tab. So it's uh, right here under the um, under DP zero <laughs> two uh, DC catalogs. Uh, so you can just click that, um, and uh, we're going to be looking at uh, deep coads. And uh, the first thing that you need to do is uh, decide what calibration level you uh, are going to use. And since we're using uh, the coads uh, that you should use uh, calibration level three, 
And uh, most of the most of the different uh, query parameters like stay the same. Uh, but uh, the first thing that we want to do is uh, put the the same coordinates uh, for the for the um, supernova. So I'm going to paste that in the chat. And uh, you would go under uh, uh, location um, under the, and you should leave it as observation boundary contains point and just put in the, uh, the same coordinates. And then uh, the other thing that you need to change is what uh, data product you want. And uh, you can see uh, there that it gives an example and uh, it's, this, it's actually what we're interested in this time. Uh, and I'm also gonna paste that in the, in the chat. Uh, but that's pretty much it as far as like setting up the search. Uh, so you just click search. And now you'll see something uh, very similar to what you saw in the previous tutorial, except now there's actually like uh, an image. Uh, but so um, as you can see in the in the table, you do have like uh, an image for all six uh, filters. Uh, this is just showing uh, the image for the for the topmost one. Uh, so the Y filter. Uh, what the first thing that we want to do is actually display uh, all six of the filters. So you can do that by going to this uh, grid icon. Uh, it should say uh, that it it just explicitly says that it'll show all of the images that are in your in your results. Um, and it takes a second. Um, and this is just centered, uh, I believe, in uh, whatever patch uh, the image is. And um, you can see the patch number in the little table. Uh, but uh, you can add things to the images, like one of the things uh, that might be useful is adding a little compass. And if you go to the uh, to this uh, wrench, uh, you can find a uh, northeast uh, no compass. Uh, but uh, since we're not actually uh, doing anything with the graphing this time, unlike the last tutorial, uh, we want to get rid of this. So we can once again go to um, by view tables. Uh, that should leave you with the with the query results, and uh, you can change between uh, the chart coverage and what we actually want this time. Oh. <laughs> that didn't happen before. Okay. That happened to me just a minute ago too. So there seem to be little glitches happen happening. Okay, so we can go over that again, I guess. <laughs> um, so just show all six images again, if that happened to you. I didn't get anything, and I don't know what I did wrong. Uh, you didn't get anything in what I, sense? I got, when I hit search, I got nothing back. That There's happened no to me. data found. Uh, that happened to me before, and okay. then I tried it again, and it was fine. <laughs> okay. All right. Sorry. Then I'll try it again. Okay, Thank so you. I guess uh, let's, let's uh, pause here and make sure that everybody that is trying has has um, the images. Was it just me who was having trouble? <laughs> that happened to me though, so. Okay, okay. Okay, well, uh, so I'll just show the compass again and uh, go to by view tables and select the data product top, 
tab uh, to just have the images and uh, the table. Um, so one of the things that you, you might want to do is like zoom in on these images. Uh, and you can do that just by going over each one of the images and like using your like uh, mouse pad, or uh, you can also use a magnifying glass. Uh, but uh, it's useful to have all of them uh, do the same thing at the same time. So to do that, you can go to this um, to this image alignment. Uh, so it has a little lock because it can lock all six, all six images to do the same thing. And so we can go to that and click align and lock uh, by WCS. Um, and now that should um, make all of the images do the same thing. Um, and then uh, since I said that this was kind of like just like the default center, the center of the patch, uh, we want to go to the actual, uh, to the location of the supernova. Uh, so you can go to this uh, center button, image center drop down, and uh, you can give it the coordinates. And then uh, go and mark. And uh, now you see that there is a, another little mark um, and you want to zoom in to that location. And I guess there's, okay. So this might happen to you that you uh, lose track of where that actually was. So you can just uh, go back to the center tool and you can look at uh, recent positions, click on that. Uh, and it should take you back to where, where the actual supernova was. Uh, but for some reason, anytime I do that, uh, I only get a mark in one of the images. So I'm just going to put the coordinates in again. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. uh, so now uh, you can see that there are some extended objects in this location. Um, and uh, you can also, uh, you can, you see that the, the order of the images is in the same order as the table. If you wanted to look at them uh, by Ugris, uh, you can just go to uh, EM underscore min, click that, and that will order them that way. And okay, in that one did what I had previously done. So <laughs> I'm going to once again, go and mark location. But, and then another thing that you can do is change the scaling of the images. Uh, and you can go to this right next to the center button. There's a stretch drop down, And if you select color stretch, it'll uh, give you a little pop-up window. And uh, we want to change the scaling to log. And uh, the default is uh, sigma, but we can uh, change it to a percent. And uh, we can change the, uh, the bounds to like between one in uh, 99.5. And uh, if this, this is for me has been always unchecked, but the tutorial says to uncheck it. So if you have it checked for some reason, just undo that. Uh, and then uh, you can refresh the image. Oh, and I, I don't know, I didn't do that. And then uh, that should change the images. And because uh, I am not a uh, galaxy person, <laughs> uh, this is uh, as far as I can uh, go in saying things about it. But now uh, it should be a little more obvious that there are actually more, uh, more objects than initially uh, thought. Uh, so tutorial notes that it is a complicated uh, host galaxy situation. And uh, that is, I guess, an exercise for you all to uh, uh, think of how you can actually determine which is the, the host galaxy. Uh, but 
I guess that's all. So Gloria, um, Tanasa had a question. Um, are these images at different epochs? I would think not. These are the co-ad images, right? So. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so yeah, they're actually, I guess, stacked from a lot okay. of epochs. Okay. There would be PVIs if they're individual epochs, probably. Yeah. That could be a, another fun exercise to go and find one of the Calex images before the supernova and one while the supernova was bright and compare them. We have other questions. Well, thanks to both Greg and Gloria. Um, that was great. <laughs> it was also impressive how quickly you re recovered every time it did something you didn't expect, Gloria. <laughs> that shows that you clearly know how to use the portal better than I do, because I would have been flustered by that. <laughs> um, OK, well, we have, uh, we have plenty of time. I think what we could do is we were due for a 10 minute break um, before we uh, get together for um, collaborative breakouts. So uh, we could just go ahead and take the 10 minute break now and um, reconvene at the top of the hour. Does that sound good to everyone? Awesome, let's do that. And we'll come back in 10 minutes at eight o'clock my time um, on the hour. Perfect. <laughs>